All right, sorcery in Dark Souls 3. It, uh, well, it kind of sucks. Unless you are in hyper mode with like 99 int, you're not going to have much of a magical experience. And it's not the easy mode it was in the previous titles. But forget about spells, what about spell tools, the catalyst itself? I mean, it's not Bloodborne's cane, but believe it or not, I can actually show you how to make a pretty damn powerful pin build. Or depending on your character, let me show you how to become the most badass bunking bottom bitch in the world. Sounds like a frequently googled question to me, and if you enjoy handling some hard wood with both hands, now let me show you how you can really stick it to Dark Souls 3. Name your hoe, your character, pick the sorcerer class and the gold coins as a starting gift. Well, initially it may seem like you get the short end of the stick when it comes to your damage output, but we actually have a secret weapon. Because just like weapons, staffs have a weapon art as well. So even without any spells, we can still use a magic buff. So let's use a stick to turn our first trick. I want the magic stick! Now I want total power! Oh fuck, that's not good at all. So it already requires a bonking barrage to even get past the tutorial boss. And not even a counter damage after a parry or knockdown adds that much extra damage. Well, at least you can consistently do that in the first phase. And fortunately, once Gundir transforms, you can avoid practically anything he does by just circling around with him clockwise. If you stay next to his right side, only his jump attack needs to be avoided. Or if your spacing is off and you end up in front of him, there's the occasional sideswipe. But with a bit of patience, the tutorial boss goes down and we can enter Firelink Shrine. Of course, first the usual stuff. Do the tree jump, uh, first try of course. Obviously the acid shard and some fine ass bling. After all, souls are the currency of this world. And I happen to know just a working girl that might be interested in some easy cash. Bitch, don't you want to start making some real fucking money? What? Well, although this staff has strength scaling that increases the melee damage, it's not exactly a worthwhile investment. So instead, let's get beefy to become, uh, well, not unkillable, but at least slightly less killable. Alright, see you after school, do you know what I am saying? Well, other than the weapon art, you cannot buff any catalyst, so there's no chance of turning it into a lightning rod. Meaning that our only other option is to increase the damage through upgrading it. Although that's not much of an increase either. So even though you could get it higher than plus one before Vort, your damage output is going to be pretty abysmal, regardless of what you do. Well, what I was actually thinking to do, and yeah, I know I never put any stupid dad jokes in my videos, but a little bit of a pun here. I was thinking of letting a summon do my work for me as my own personnel, because it's staff only. You know, get it? Personnel? Staff? So it's like a player with- Ah! Okay, I suppose I really deserve that one. So, I guess I'll just fight this stupid boss on my own. Well, sticks and stones may break his bones, but given that we only have a stick, we will need to show our stones by charging bravely into battle with a low damage output. Now, fortunately, Vort's first phase is no problem, just like in any run. Just stay underneath or behind him. But contrary to practically any other playthrough, this time we won't be able to kill Vort before he finishes his giant ice breath attack, meaning that we have to deal with his second phase moveset. Wait, Vort has a second phase moveset? Yes, apparently he does. And no, I don't have a lot of experience with that moveset either. And it's actually pretty tricky to deal with, since during most of his attacks, his entire body becomes a giant hitbox. So it's best to only use singular attacks so you can focus on dodging. Although keep in mind that his slam attacks are quite delayed, so that can easily get you roll caught. Fortunately, he will do the free charges followed by the ice breath quite frequently, so that is where you can get most of your damage in. Although speaking of hitboxes, you can quite easily get frostbitten even when behind him. So that's also a hitbox that needs to be respected. Just like how elders treat them with respect as well. What on earth? Well, what the fight against Vort did show us is that we need a better catalyst than this one. But what exactly does that entail? Just one that hits harder? Well, remember that every stick has two hands, so maybe we need to look at this from a different perspective. Maybe we don't merely need to have a better melee attack, maybe we need a better weapon art. So first get another Essence Shard, then observe from Software's glorious AI design, then avoid the Boreal Knight sword without dodging it, simply by outspacing it like a pro and totally not by complete accident, and then make your way through the road of sacrifices. Because here we can use the gold coins we picked up as a starting gift to farm for a catalyst with a very unique special ability. Oh, uh, sorry, first I need to have a word with uh, husband Henri. And yes, I realize that I come across as the aggressor here, but if your husband comes home with a guy in a gimp costume, 
then it might be time to question your marriage. However, that's beside the point, what we are really here for is the Storyteller staff. So use your coins for extra item discovery, and then 1, 2, smack him blue, 3, 4, kill him some more, and around attempt 5 or 6, you can pick up sticks. Well, only one, and it probably will take more than 6 attempts, but this will be the staff that provides us access later on to another staff with the highest melee damage. Because the Storyteller staff does not excel in R2 attacks. It's the weapon art that we are interested in, as it spews a very potent type of poison, even more stronger than toxic. And speaking of toxicity, why the fuck does From Software feel the need to put dogs in our fucking games? Yeah, I'm already looking forward to all the dog related shenanigans that will be in Elden Ring. Okay, and the dog actually glitched into the tree. Yeah, working as intended. Well, it's fine by me, because that allows me to demonstrate the power of the Storyteller Staff's weapon art. As you can see, it's almost DS2 levels of poison power. Now, unfortunately, there are only a handful of bosses in this game that can be poisoned in the first place. However, the Crystal Sage is one of them. So let's head there first, but before going towards the boss arena, let's pay a visit to Orbeck to show him what we think of his old fashioned ways. <laughs> sorcery. Int is just blue decks after all, we all know that by now. Now the blue pellets will come in handy though, because the Crystal Sage is also stuck in his old ways, so you might want to have some extra magic resistance. Although with the power of poison, we can just wait behind a wall, where we are safe from his projectiles, and in the meantime the poison will drain away most of his health bar. Oh, and make sure that you stay behind this wall, because sitting down behind the rocks in the corner is only safe when the boss is not in his original starting position. Because when he is, his crystal hill might still hit you there. However, as powerful as this poison is, you will need to proc it twice to kill him. So that's where the blue pellets come in, to provide some extra defense when you go in for another cast when all the clones are out. Speaking of which, keep an eye on the right side of the screen, because the clones can in fact move around, and depending on their initial positions, it is possible for one to move far enough to the right so that you are in his line of sight. So if that happens, you will need to quickly go in for a melee attack. Fortunately, clones always die in a single hit. So all in all, that was actually an easy Crystal Sage fight. But of course, most bosses are immune to poison. So it's not the case that this staff will carry us through the entire game. But other than being offensive, we also need to get defensive. So Lloyd's shield ring would certainly come in handy. However, the ashes required to buy that ring are guarded by a certain NPC. However, there's a neat little trick that you can do, and should be easy to perform with the Storyteller Staff, because if you poison this NPC, and then get out of his aggro range, he will still be aggroed, but since you are not around, he will try to attack the other NPC on the staircase. So there he goes, there he goes, he's going in for the attack, and uh, no. No, 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 all that aggression, that's, that's not good for anyone. Just take a deep breath, count to ten, and relax. Then again, aggression is like poison eating away at you from the inside and you just want to release it all. So there he goes again. Yeah, he's going to do it. He's going to lay the fuck smack upon... Uh... Nah, now nah, that's a very toxic behavior. Nah, we cannot have that. But then again, you cannot always play things safe in life. Sometimes you just need to risk everything and just go straight towards your goals. However, then you hesitate and the decision fades. And then you are at the end of your life and you will die with regrets. Thinking of what could have been, what you could have done, but didn't have the fortitude to see through. Do not let that happen, kids. Anyway, with the ashes behind the NPC, we can now purchase Lloyd Shieldring. Which is pretty much better than armor, as long as you are at full health at least. Well, speaking of armor, I could have used 10,000 souls to spend on valuable levels, but I chose to buy a stupid looking hat instead. But I regret nothing. Yet. Alright, so now let's head towards the cathedral, meaning we are going to get chased by teleporting dogs. In fact, it has literally happened to me once that I opened up the door and the dog was magically already on the other side. And it would be helpful to keep an eye on what's going on behind me when opening the door, but I was a little too fashionable for that to be viable. Fucking hell, dogs are just relentless in this game. Well, I guess it makes sense this time because I think he wants to play fetch. Okay, here boy, get the stick, get the stick boy. Okay, get the stick. No, no, don't get the stick. <laughs> Maybe I'm more of a cat person. <laughs> Animals are for eating and uh, nothing else. Not that I even like meat, but I do enjoy pissing off vegans. Anyway, let's pick up another Essence shard. And I could have picked up a bone shard as well, but that's less relevant. But what is really relevant to know is that there is a sort of, well, not shortcut really, but more of a safer route to take across the roof. Because from there, you can easily jump on top of that. What the fuck? Okay, then a weird glitch occurred that took away my amber and made the footage appear added in some way. I mean, from software, am I right? 
But at least then we can go down the elevator and we can open up the first actual shortcut. Then we go back up the elevator and down again to kill the giant. I mean, it should be very easy to poison him from down here. Oh, uh, or maybe not. Okay, then I guess we're just going to YOLO it towards Lloyd's sword ring. Because we do need that for later. And it actually worked out perfectly. Of course, after boning back, I realized that I still had to go through here to unlock the next shortcut. Yeah, normally I never take this route. But at least fortunately Kirk didn't invade along the way because I died at that because that weird amber glitch occurred. So that's helpful at least. And even though I wouldn't need to respect during this run, I still wanted to go towards Rosaria's bonfire because there's actually an interesting little shortcut that you can take from there down towards the deacons by surviving the fall down the elevator and activating it in reverse intended order, so to speak. By using either the silver cat ring, which we don't have, but alternatively with the spook spell that we can get from Orbeck. I mean, it's not a spell that inflicts damage after all, it's one that prevent. What the hell? Why did Orbeck not show up in Firelink? What could I possibly have done to offend him? Okay then, for now, uh, just forget about the deacons. In fact, poison is not even enough anyway, because of the healers and because of the curse buildup. However, the Abyss Watchers are immune to poison. So fighting them at this point sounds a little intimidating if you ask me. So, therefore, let's fight Frida instead. So let's dive stupid head first into the DLC. Oh, and along the way we encounter a crystal lizard that drops light titanite shards. And that will be helpful later on in the run. And another set after the section with the wolves. Now in between that we encounter a mandatory fight with Wilhelm. And although he can be poisoned, he can also heal, so that's kind of a pain in the stick. However, we can cheese him with a little handy exploit. For which I actually should have equipped a shield, because that works a lot better. But the thing is that if you lure him towards the cliff and dodge him when he charges at you, you can bonk him right off the cliff. Or better said, with a shield you can do a shield push. You know the kick animation when you have a shield equipped in two hands. Which, given that it does no damage, would actually have been within the rules of the run. However, even though bashing with the staff doesn't push him back enough to actually knock him off the cliff, for some reason he de aggros when he's trying to move away from the cliff. So therefore we don't even need the infinite omnipotent force of gravity. Uh, it does suck though that now I cannot use the Desert File sound clip for this part. So that, that is definitely a shame. However, that's not the worst thing about this run though. The real problem is Frida. First of all, because she has a very high resistance to poison. But most importantly, the game mechanic that is dreaded by every lover of fighting games. Input reading. Frida is designed to frequently and instantly dodge whenever you cast a spell or use a throwable item. So getting Frida to actually stay inside of the poison cloud long enough is a real pain. Your best chance is when she turns invisible, but even when she is charging her invisible grab attack or whatever you want to call it, she might still decide to dodge your poison cloud. Now, fortunately, it only takes two procs to drain her health bar, and you can simply get a few bonks in when the poison is doing its thing to speed up that process. Now, contrary to Frida, Ariandel is extremely susceptible to poison, and he is a huge target. Unfortunately, because of Frida's input reading, when you are casting, she starts dodging and often towards you. So on a little side note, especially using poison knives is therefore a terribly inconvenient way to poison Ariandel. Now, the good thing though is that when Ariandel is poisoned, you can just circle around the room and focus on avoiding both bosses' attacks. Unfortunately, Frida has yet another way of being a stick in the mud, as she will try to undo your poison damage by periodically casting a healing miracle on Ariandel. However, this can be used to her advantage, as Frida has to sit still when healing. Meaning you have the opportunity to poison her as well. And yes, even though the two bosses share a life bar, both of them can be poisoned at once. Which means that their shared health bar will go down twice as fast. But then of course, in the third phase, it's again a painful experience to get the poison going, because Frida moves around so much. Again, when she goes invisible is her best bet, or after she does a jump attack. And since you only need to poison her twice, you can just focus on dodging her, which is good because god motherfucking damn it, does she love to spam attacks during this phase. Alright, but what exactly was the whole point of doing this fight? Well, it was to get early access to the Ringed City DLC. Because there we can acquire the most powerful staff in the game. First of course we need to take a plunge. We won't die because of the magic circles on the ground. Which wouldn't exactly protect you if there happens to be, I don't know, glass along the way. Now instead of going left past the Banner Knight, 
If you go the other way, then all the way in the back, you will find the murky long staff. And that thing is hardcore, it's certainly not a little twig. Of course it would have been handy if I had a homeward bone equipped, so uh, now I first need to get to safety. Okay, well this looks pretty safe. Holy Christ on a stick with a little horizontal stick to make it the shape of a cross. <sighs> well anyway, the reason the murky long staff is so damn good is because it has high base damage. It does dark damage that you can buff with a weapon art on top of that. And it scales with strength, dex and intelligence. So it's not merely a good catalyst, it's simply a good weapon. Only downside is the limited moveset. But we can work around that. Now of course we first need to upgrade it, so time to go to Farron Keep for the Dream Chaser Ashes. Along the way we have another example of From Software's glorious hyper-intelligent AI design. Now then again maybe this one is literally working as intended. Because in the world of Dark Souls everyone seems to be tired of living. And the great thing about dead people is that you can take their stuff. Damn, now that is what you call a staff. Lore wise this one came from Sorcerer Chat Thunderstick. So there you go, tell Vadi to make a video about that one. Now extinguish the flames, get another ashes shard and an undead bone shard. Then acquire the dream chaser ashes for regular titanite shards. And by taking out the crystal lizards near the dragon corpse, due to our trip through the ashes of Ariandel before, we can upgrade to plus 5. Now there are more large tits <coughs> in Smoldering Lake and we are going towards the abyss watchers anyway. And plus 5 is more than sufficient against them even though you cannot backstab with a staff. But despite that, attacking when you would normally go for a backstab guarantees a save attack. Especially because the Abyss Watchers have this weird property of seemingly random hyper armor. So just randomly wailing away at them has an RNG factor where they might suddenly counterattack right through your attacks. So I would say that it's best to simply approach this fight like you would normally do. Also they may be dark resistant, but they are not blunt force trauma resistant and they don't have a lot of health to begin with. So our damage output is more than decent if you ask me. But of course after this boss we can get more large titanite shards, which is the name of stones used as smithing materials children. And there are several in the catacombs already, but more than enough down in Smoldering Lake. On top of that, there's a crystal lizard there that drops titanite chunks, so that we can upgrade to plus 7. However, we can definitely do better than that. After all, we already have access to the drag heap. And there are a bunch of chunks in that area. Now of course that does mean that we have to deal with the annoying angels. But fortunately there is a little unintended shortcut that allows you immediate access to the real body of the first one. Which is also a great shortcut to quickly get to the twin demon boss fight by the way. However, in the actual swamp section, we will have to avoid the angelic barrage in order to even get to its real body. And speaking of our own body, there is some appropriate fashion that we can acquire here for this run, namely the Desert Sorcerer set, also known as the Booba Armor. I'm not completely sure, but I think this shiny over here is part of that set. Mm, no, a loincloth, that's not it. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure about the fashion value of this one. Well, at least after taking care of the second angel, we have an easier time picking up all the chunks, the actual Booba Armor, and the third rate fab. It's not my proudest ring, but you know, it's there, it's easy to get your hands on, and sometimes you just really need it. Now technically there are some more chunks, and there are a few in the ashes of Ariandel as well. And if you want short you can even farm for it. But that's a bit of a hassle and really not necessary. There are also chunks beyond the Dancer, and with her weakness to both strike and dark damage, at plus 8 we can give her a really good spanking. And no, I'm not trying to be funny there, that's quite literally what you are doing, at least for the most part of that fight. Especially because I finally learned how to deal with the dancer the quote unquote appropriate way. When it comes to her second phase, by sticking close to her right leg, just like we do in the first phase. But that's because now on PS5 I have the benefit of 60 FPS, whereas on PS4 you wouldn't even get 30 FPS in the dancer fight. And I had a really hard time avoiding especially her backwards overhead attack in the second phase because of all the frame drops. So as my regular viewers know, I purposely used the fighter in a suboptimal way, but one where you at least wouldn't have to worry about that specific attack. However, with the FPS upgrade, I finally got a better way of handling this fight.
So with Pontiff's personal pole dancer out of the way, we can acquire the final chunks and another acid shard. Oh, and by the way, our stamina consumption is quite low, so we can literally keep the Great Axe Hollow stun locked until he's dead, despite his large health pool for a regular enemy. And I assume that everyone already knows this trick, but in case you don't, if you walk up this armor to drop down, the dragons won't wake up and you'll have a much easier time making it across. And then of course, activate the elevator so that we can easily access the dragon slayer armor later on. So with that we have fully upgraded what's arguably the most powerful staff in the game when it comes to melee attacks. And our stats are looking pretty good as well. So let's face it, this is simply a viable sorcerer build. I mean that's the nature of Dark Souls 3, the best sorcerer build is a melee build. So just leave out the spells, you don't need them, they're a nuisance. Oh and speaking of nuisances, with a plus 10 strike weapon, Wolnir would obviously be no issue. However fighting him the normal way would not be satisfying enough. I mean, after all the pain he put us through in the past with his spooky mist, it's time that we show him who the true Vape Lord is. Because weirdly enough, as long as Wolnir is asleep, you can actually poison him, even though he becomes immune the moment he wakes up. And what's even weirder is that you can proc the poison by just hovering a cloud above his bracelets. But then you can just sit back and watch his health drain away from the harmful effects of smoking for once. Much more satisfying, especially since you'll get a special death animation instead of him sliding backwards into the abyss. And what's less satisfying though is that I did mess up the waving gesture. So I had to settle for waving at the cup instead. Now of course we cannot enter Airfill without the doll, so now it is the right time for the deacons. And although bonking with our plus 10 staff would be more than effective, we can use poison in a very unique way in this fight, namely by abusing the typical from software clipping issues together with an off-screen mechanic that they used for the boss's health bar. The Archdeacon is actually already inside of the boss arena at the start of the fight. He's hidden inside the giant structure in the center, meaning that you can cast the poison weapon art right through the wall, and that way you can hit him even though you're not actually meant to be able to do so. And once his health is low enough for him to appear for the second phase, which is lower by the way than when killing the red glowing deacons like you normally would, you can simply start bonking away. And given that I didn't have any alluring skulls on me, I decided to simply let the poison finish the fight for me when things got a bit too crowded around the Archdeacon. Oh, and speaking of the Archdeacon, given the time of year, and the fact that I'm a Dutch guy, and I'm already holding a staff, I cannot pass up this opportunity for a Sinterklaas cosplay. Oh, sorry, I guess for all you English speaking folk, I should say, uh, uh, Signed your claws. The sack of Scienter Claus, Scienter Claus, Scienter Claus, the sack of Scienter Claus, oh boy, oh boy, what a boss fight against Jorm. Because we cannot use the Storm Ruler after all, although actually, the Murky Longstaff lives up to its name, because it's long enough to directly hit Jorm's head whenever he does the two-handed attack. And even though you cannot repose with it, and you often don't even get the full headshot damage because you hit his shoulder or whatever, this is still actually not even an ineffective way of fighting him. I mean it's definitely a lot quicker than with a plus zero dagger, even with the repose damage. Oh and of course on the way towards Jorm, make sure to pick up the dark clutch ring to boost the dark damage of your staff. Now because you cannot repose, you would think that Pontiff would become a very difficult boss fight. However that's not actually the case, because you will still get bonus counter damage after you pimp slap his weapon away, and quite a surprising amount in fact, and given that he is not immune to poison, and the fact that he needs to stop moving to go into second phase or to summon the clone, speaking of which he did troll me by not immediately summoning the clone right after the transition, but then you can simply stay away from him until the poison finishes the fight for you. And that's a pretty humorous way to end the life of a tyrant like him. And of course if he gives you a parry opportunity anyway, you can add to that humor with some extra slapstick. But then just stay away and enjoy his suffering. Oh I'm toxic again, good. That's great. I, I barely stepped into the cloud. I'm toxic. Thanks. Now I'm toxic, so I'm fucked. Fucking bullshit, dude! What do you want me to do? From software! Duh! Cause no one will cheat with this game mechanic! <laughs> We're so smart! <laughs> now Aldrich is a bit more tricky due to his dark resistance. However, you will do extra damage when you hit Gwendolyn instead of Aldrich himself. Which is actually pretty tragic if you think about it. Moreover, you can manipulate this boss's AI. As long as you stay about a roll distance away from the Gwendolyn part, whenever he comes out of an attack animation, he will never teleport, except for the phase transition, 
and more importantly, he won't do the massive arrow rain in the second phase. Now it is tricky to keep that exact amount of distance, because of all the fire he leaves on the ground in the second phase. But to be fair, it's not the weirdest thing anyone has ever done with a stick. Of course it hurts. Of course it's fire. Of course it's pain. Of course it's... Ah, 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 shut up. I can handle it. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Now, Dragon Slayer armor is also dark resistant, but given that we mostly do strike damage, you don't even notice that that much. Moreover, whenever he charges, especially at the end of his free hit combo, you can run around him, which allows for some extra free hits. Oh, and I forgot to actually turn the music off in this fight, again, because the thing is that that actually helps a lot during the second phase, since the Pilgrim Butterflies have three separate sound cues indicating which variation of their projectile attacks they are going to do, and of course that it's coming in the first place. After all, they are the real danger in this fight, if you ask me. So now we have access to the archives, and over here we encounter another Crystal Sage. So time to take out the Storyteller staff again. Because if you poison him, he will stay poisoned even if he teleports away. So after you poison him, just parry and, well, not repost him, but regardless it still allows for some free hits of course. And then you can just wait down here while the poison drains away his health, and you point and laugh from this point of safety. HOLY SHIT STICK! Okay, here we are truly safe. And if his health wasn't low enough for the poison to finish him off, we can just run in to get the final attacks in. And with him down, the biggest threat in this area is taken care of. I mean, there are some enemies here that can chase you, but they tend to give up pretty quickly. Or maybe I've spoken too soon again. What the hell dude, I guess the overaggressive enemies from my plus zero dagger run are back again. Yeah, okay, let's quickly take the elevator down to safety. Uh, what the frick? He's actually on the top of the freaking elevator. Yeah, this is not what I ordered, so return to sender. Okay, so let's open up the shortcut and then continue onwards. Dude, that dipstick is still on top of the elevator. This guy's like a freaking guard dog, so I, I guess this is similar to what happened before at the cathedral. So maybe we should just do the same. Come boy, get the stick, fetch, fetch. Yeah, it's pretty impressive, right, that I can play around with this enemy while avoiding all the magic. So, at the top of the archives, you find an NPC that holds the crystal staff. So, I was wondering whether that one would be better against the princess, since they are also dark resistant. And because of the elevator, you can de-aggro the NPC trio, and then sneak a sneaky little poison cloud in. And then use the elevator again to escape like a little bit, like a very strategic person who plays the game in a very smart way. <clears throat> Unfortunately, despite the fact that this staff gains a 30% damage boost from its weapon art, it upgrades with titanite skills and I don't have those. And even if I did upgrade it to max, it wouldn't outclass the murky longstaff anyway. But to be fair, we didn't need another staff to begin with, because the murky longstaff performed actually really well against the princess. The buff doesn't add much, but the damage is still surprisingly high. On top of that, because of its length, it's quite easy to hit Lothric with it in the second phase. Oh, and make sure that you stay near the fog wall, because that allows you to consistently avoid Lothric's homing magic projectiles. Oh, but be careful though, when they themselves are close to the fog wall, because then you might get hit before you even start rolling. And on top of that, then you have to make sure that you turn the camera towards them, because although they won't teleport directly on top of you, they may move within melee range before the projectile barrage is ended. So this is a good strategy, but it's not completely foolproof. But after spanking the young prince for not being an obedient little lord of cinder, we only have the soul of cinder remaining before we can finish the run. But of course, you probably wonder how this build would fare against the bosses that still remain. So I guess that before we end this run, it is time again for another montage. Straight eat it up. And I ain't no hoop in my toes that look. I'm in the jelly rope and never switch. Nice tonight. 
And there we go, that's how you beat Dark Souls 3 staff damage only. So even if you are on PC with a mouse and keyboard, you can still do a joystick run. Thanks for sticking now till the end of the video. And if you want to see more of me, then click the subscribe button and check the links to my other Dark Souls 3 videos, particularly my smoke damage only livestream, or a somewhat related run would be my recent Dark Souls 2 chime damage only run. And if you want to become part of my personal support staff, then consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Thank you all for watching and I will see you next time.